adverse drug reactions, whether it's drug, drug, drug condition, drug renal, drug liver, drug pharmacogenetic, they result in they re result in deaths, unfortunately. And, and deaths from adverse drug reactions are the fourth cause of death in the United States, um, maybe fifth or sixth in Canada. So that's that's the background to why we're doing it. And it's absolutely right that the pharmacogenetics determines the serum level of the active ingredients in in, in your system. Welcome to the Pharmacy Quality Solutions Quality Corner Show, where we believe that quality measurement leads to better outcomes. Let us become your go-to source for all things related to quality and medication use in healthcare. We will hit on trending health topics as they relate to performance measurements and find common ground for payers and practitioners. We will discuss how the Equip platform can help you with your performance goals, and we will also make sure to keep you up to date on pharmacy quality news. So buckle up and put your thinking cap on. The Quality Corner Show starts now. Hello, Quality Corner Show listeners. This is your host, Nick Dorich, and we welcome you to the PQS Quality Corner Show. We are continuing our episodes here in March 2021, celebrating great efforts that pharmacists go to provide patient care. Whether it's immunizations, point of care services, adherence interventions, pharmacists are improving patient care in a large number of ways. But those are all items that pharmacists have been doing or are currently expanding existing services. Well, what about services that could become a new standard of care for pharmacists to provide? Today's episode is going to focus on one such topic, a pharmacist-provided service that may or may not be widely expanded or available yet. With that introduction, let's go ahead and bring in today's guest for the episode. Please welcome Martin Dawes, Chief Scientific Officer from Genexis. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, great to be here. And a little bit about myself. I'm a family physician. Um, I'm an academic background in evidence-based medicine. As you can tell from the accent, I came from the UK. I spent eight cold winters in Montreal working at McGill uh, and then moved out to the West Coast where... Uh, uh, I worked at UBC until uh, I was head of department of family practice until 2017, and now work a lot with the company that we spun out from UBC called Genexus. Thanks, Martin. As I'm racking my head to think about guests that we've had on the show before, I could be wrong, but I think you're the first physician we've had on the show. We've had lots of pharmacists, but first physician. Uh, I think you're the first person from the UK on the show, so you're, you're hitting a couple of marks on it. We have had other folks living in Canada on the show, so there, there's a few other that have beaten you to that, uh, that, that, that notice, but you're doing well here. Now, before we go into today's conversation, you explained your background, and I appreciate that. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, company or organization that you work for now? Uh, if you can go over that, then we'll go ahead and jump into the questions for today. Sure, great. So I've been doing pharmacogenetic research since I was at McGill, and the uh, the focus of the company was how you translate this really quite difficult information uh, into something that a, a pharmacist or a physician can use in seconds uh, to alter the drug options in front of them for the condition the patient's presenting with. Uh, so we actually spent a lot of time at the university creating algorithms, and I'll talk a little bit about that perhaps in the questions that follow, um, but it was the basis of those algorithms that was the intellectual property that spun out the company. And the company now provides those algorithms, the decision support for pharmacogenetics um, in uh, Canada and uh, basically across North America. That sounds great. It's data science, it's pharmacists, it's physicians working collaboratively to improve patient care. These these are some of my favorite words all mixed together, Martin. So I'm really excited for this conversation today. And uh, with that, we're going to jump into the content for our show, and I'm going to provide a quick overview of what comes next for our audience. There are three questions that are written down for us to explore. I'm going to go down the list and ask the first question. Martin, you're going to then get a chance to respond. We may have some back and forth to summarize the key points. We're going to repeat that process for the second and third questions, and then we're going to wrap up uh, the, the primary content for the recording. When we get to the end, we always finish with something that's a little bit more fun, and it may not be a pharmacy or medicine-specific question, but it helps us to get to know you, our guest, a little bit better. Now, with that, let's go ahead. We're going to jump into question one. 
So Martin, many of our listeners know about pharmacogenomics or pharmacogenetic testing, but probably at a high level. It's not something that's really been expanded here, at least in the United States. But I want to hear what that actually means. And we should explore why this testing is important for optimizing a patient's care, how it plays a role for primary care physicians, uh, other prescribers, uh, other members of the care team, and especially how a pharmacist ties into that. So why does this type of service exist and why will we see it have expanded use for pharmacists? Great. So, uh, yeah. So why pharmacogenetics um, in primary care, I would say? So pharmacogenetics accounts for a significant variation in medication responses um, that affect the level of active ingredients impacting the likelihood of harm or benefit from a medication. Secondly, pharmacogenetic variants are really common. I mean, basically, we've all got some. And uh, sorry, the variants for um, some common drugs, such as antidepressants, occur in as many as a third of us. So, you know, this isn't just about rare conditions, uh, inherited uh, disorders of metabolism. This is about the stuff that we look after, pain, cardiovascular disease, mental health conditions, really common to see variants affecting those medications. So that that's a bit of the why. Martin, with some of those instances, and would, I'd like to have you expand on the importance of understanding this. You, you mentioned it can be impacting some very common medications used for treatment with antidepressants, uh, metabolism, pain. Yeah. I'm even just thinking in some recent news stories or articles related mm-hmm. to use of uh, uh, blood thinners and how pharmacogenomics. So you know, from this, it it can go both ways, right? It can mean that the patient's getting more of the therapeutic, uh, you know, medication or element that they need, or perhaps not enough. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. I mean, the reason that we came to this is because we can't predict what's going to happen when we give an individual medication as accurately as we would like to. Um, And as a result, adverse drug reactions, whether it's drug, drug, drug condition, drug renal, drug liver, drug pharmacogenetic, they result in, uh, they re- result in deaths, unfortunately. And, and uh, deaths from adverse drug reactions are the fourth cause of death in the United States, um, maybe fifth or sixth in Canada. So that's, that's the background to why we're doing it. And it's absolutely right that the pharmacogenetics determines the serum level of the active ingredient in, in, in your system. And you pick on, on blood thinners, clopidogrel with CYP2C19, absolutely. There is this, you know, you get a variant where your, your, your enzyme function for switching clopidogrel into the active compound just isn't working as well. And suddenly, you don't have that antiplatelet activity that you expect by giving the drug to the patient. So, you know, this is sort of the hidden factor. And it could be liver. It could be liver metabolism that's doing it. It could be renal um, clearance if it's a, a renally cleared drug. It, it could be drug-drug interaction that, that does that. All of these are things that can Im- impact the serum level of the active ingredient. And we have to take them all into account when we're making prescribing decisions. Thanks, Martin. And clopidogrel is the exact medication I was thinking of that's been making news recently. So it seems you and I are on the same wavelength there. And and your your point is very well said. As a clinician, you want the patient getting the right dose of the medication that is effective for treating and getting the expected uh, therapeutic benefit while also minimizing or not hopefully not experiencing any adverse side effects or drug events. So if, if the body is metabolizing the drug in a different way and it has an impact there, that's not good for the patient's treatment, and uh, we want to avoid that situation. We'll go now to our second question, and we started this conversation with the why. And that makes sense if uh, you've ever read up on Simon Sinek, and it starts with motivation. The most important question is starting with why. But I want to transition now to the what of pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetic testing. With more prevalence of pharmacogenetic testing, what will it do for, for patient care? Are patients going to be getting better medications? Is there a shorter path to effective treatment? From a patient perspective, what are they going to be experiencing? It's a, it's a great question. And, and I, I'll go back uh, probably now 10 years where I went into the first pharmacogenetic lab and they were talking about these star things. I just wanted a pharmacogenetic result that would tell me whether it was safe to prescribe codeine or citalopram or whatever. Uh, these guys were talking about star alleles, and I 
didn't know what on earth that was. I thought we were talking about genes, not stars. But so there's a whole new terminology. But let's step back. What a patient experiences is a swab. Um, so it's like CSI. Uh, you put the swab in your mouth and you scrape a little bit of your uh, cells out of that. And then that is sent off to a lab, hopefully a good lab. Um, and that lab will extract the DNA from those cells. There are, you, you can see this happening in CSI, but where the difference lies is maybe CSI is actually looking at the whole genome. When you're talking about pharmacogenetics, we're talking about 60 to 180 variants out of the 3 billion that are available in your DNA. So this is very targeted. Um, and so then the company will use a technology to identify uh, those variants. What happens is that they use a, a chemical marker. So you've got a pair, a couple of base pairs, and these are adenine, cytosine, uh, guanine, or thymine. And basically what happens is that, say, the ad adenine gets replaced by a cytosine. And so we need a chemical marker that would say, oh, look, at, at this point in, in the DNA, we've got a substitution. And the technology uh, uses fluorescence a lot of the time to detect that difference. And so the machines pick up that. Now, this has been 30 years of work to create these machines. Um, and so from a patient point of view, what they would uh, see is a, a thing about the size of a large refrigerator. Uh, and that is the machine that does this really clever technology. And out of that will spit your genotype. It'll tell you whether you've had your uh, adenine replaced by a cytosine in that particular part of your DNA, which is meaningless. Because uh, that, that allele, that difference, uh, whether it's star two because it's a replacement and you've got this new terminology where your adenine has been replaced by cytosine, it's now called a star allele. And that might be inactivating that part of the gene, or it might be making it more active in terms of the metabolism of the drug. So that active, less active, is what we call the phenotype. And there are a whole group of people around the world taking those star alleles, that genotype, and saying, what is the phenotype? And the, the best example is a group called CPIC. It's probably the best uh, group in the world. It's got thousands of, of pharmacists, physicians, geneticists, all looking at that information and then saying, okay, this person with this genetic variant, this is what we really think would be happening if they took that drug, which is what I want as a patient and is what I want as a, a pharmacist or a physician. So you've got all these translations from the swab, uh, putting it in the machine, coming out with your genotype, then translating it to the phenotype. Martin, a couple of follow-up questions that I'll have for you. And the first one is going to be related to that swab. Now, when because of the way the last year and a half has been, most people are thinking they hear swab, they're going to immediately go to a deep nasal swab. What kind of swab are we talking about here? Is this a, a cheek swab, you know, back of the tongue swab, nasal yeah. swab? What is what is this exactly? It, it's uh, The best one is uh, it, to be around the edge of the teeth. Buckle swab is what it's called. So that's where the cells come out more easily. If you go higher up on the cheek, you don't get many cells coming off. Um, it is certainly not a, a pharyngeal nasal swab, which I have had and I can share with your audience. It is the most unpleasant thing. Well, there are other unpleasant procedures in medicine, but this one is right up there as a, uh, you, know, you want that to finish fairly fast. Uh, so this is, you know, the, the buckle swab is, well, we actually use sponge in our, te in our technology, um, which is really pleasant. Um, and actually has a, a bit of cool liquid that goes with it that, that preserves the DNA. So you can have it hanging around for weeks, uh, which enables uh, you to send these samples in, in the mail. And it doesn't matter if it's going through heat or cold, uh, the, the liquid preserves the DNA. And most companies are using those sorts of technologies. Gotcha. So that sounds pretty simple. That's good to hear. Now, when a patient does get a test done and gets this information completed, one thing I'd like to, to understand, does a patient get that information back? Is that something they should be immediately sharing with, say, their family, you know, the, the, their primary care physician? Is that something they should be sharing with their pharmacist? And, and we'll get into this a little bit more with our third question. But when they get that response, what do they do with it? 
Right. And we will get a, into that with a, with a third response. But basically, yes, that information is, is as important as your liver function. Um, and if you've got impaired, if you've, if you've had uh, fibrosis of your liver, every person who's going to be in the clinical pathway of prescribing should be aware of that. Uh, so you'll be putting your hand up and saying, oh, by the way, I, I've got fibrosis of the liver. Or it might be, oh, by the way, I'm taking a blood thinner. Equally important because you really don't want to give other drugs that could interact with the blood thinner. I've had my pharmacogenetics done. Um, it's as important as saying those things. The only tricky thing is you might not get the warm reception you do and relief on a physician's face when they, you're telling them that, that you're on a blood thinner and they go, phew, okay, I didn't give you a drug that might have made that worse. There is more complexity to the analysis of the pharmacogenetics. And so it, it is important, but there is a barrier to that interpretation, which we'll come to. One other question on the patient aspect here before we move to, to our third question. Is this something that a patient just needs to get done once in their lifetime and, and that's it? Or is that something that, hey, I may get this here and now in March of 2021 and I should get the pharmaco, I should get my pharmacogenomics tested again in 20 years? What is that like? We do say it is for life, but uh, honestly, the differences that we're seeing, um, there's just been another article about that gene CYP2C19 that, that with uh, clopidogrel. Uh, it was actually looking at another drug, and they found another variation of that. And basically, that's not being tested for uh, today, not widely anyway. Um, and so as these new variations come out, then more of your test done today might become out of date. It's it's not going to be critical because the the... The current variations that we see are the ones with the most serious impact that have been identified. What we're seeing now in, in the later um, uh, journal articles is, is smaller variations, less likely to see them. If you have your whole genome sequenced at birth, that's going to be the answer. No question, because we've got everything then. We've got every possible variation covered. But no one's really talking about that. So we've got this interim period of, say, five to 20 years where we'll have panels. And most of those panels will be future-proof for those five to 20 years. But as time goes on, people will move to whole genome sequencing and the analysis of that, and that's what we'll end up with. That makes a lot of sense, Martin. So thanks for that further explanation. We'll, we'll now go to our final question for our primary content. And we, we already dipped into this a little bit. How does the pharmacy get their hands on this information? How do they get involved with pharmacogenetic testing? Um, from a pharmacist standpoint, I'm interested. This is not, I, I had a faint understanding of it and some basic understandings of this when I was going through pharmacy school myself, but certainly as more information becomes available, that can change. So is it suggested that there's other advanced training pharmacists should get to using this information and then it might be interesting to talk a little bit about dispensing systems and other technology, you know, how this can be implemented today. So there, there's a lot we can get into and how a practicing pharmacist can use this and, I, and I'll let you take it from here. Okay, so uh, I've, I've, I've hinted that there is another part to this, which is the translation of genotype to phenotype. Um, and that's where we spent a lot of our time and, and pharmacists and physicians we worked with back at 10 years ago, were saying, you know, we don't want a separate guidance, like having, a, you know, we all go and look up our drug-drug interaction tables, but then we have to look up our drug renal table, and then we have to look up our drug liver table, and then we have to look up drug condition tables. So where someone has epilepsy and you wouldn't be giving them bupropion probably. So you've already got those four distinct databases of information, and now you're giving me pharmacogenetics. I don't want to look up five individual tables to identify the list of medication options I can give to this patient. And that's what we're really doing. If a patient comes in with a mental health disorder like depression, there are maybe 20 to 25 different drugs that you could give. You might throw out a few because they've tried them already. You might throw out a few because you know the side effects for that person will be intolerable. And then you've got a, a list of, say, 15. And the liver and renal and drug-drug interaction and drug condition interaction and pharmacogenetics is going to affect that. So what we produced was some software that takes all that into account. 
And it may leave that list of 15, but now it's saying, okay, dose adjustment here, 50% reduction, that means this dose. Uh, it may mean, please don't give this drug because it's contraindicated in, in that genetic variant, but it'll still be there for the pharmacist or physician to see. And that's where we think the technology is going because it's so difficult as a, a clinician with 49 seconds to make up your your decisions about which drug option to discuss with the patient. You need something that will pick up all those databases and put it into one package and say, okay, here are the 15 drugs. Let's walk through them together. And price will be part of that as well and other things. So we, we put all that in. Um, so that the pharmacist can really see instantly, within seconds, okay, for this patient, these are the drug options. But it also will identify where they haven't got the information. So if they haven't got the liver function, which may happen, that will be identified. Um, and if they haven't got the pharmacogenetics, that will also be identified. So we're trying to make it as simple for clinicians to understand this information. And we're trying to get away from the need for, you need a 42-hour accredited course for $2,000 to be able to use pharmacogenetics. No, seriously, you should be able to have software that enables you to, uh, to be able to uh, drive this new science safely and effectively. Making this information available is one key part, but helping to make a very clean and clear dis decision tree, excuse me, available for the uh, provider is just as important to how this information gets used. It's a really great concept, and I, it, certainly the benefits for improving patient care, getting the patient onto the right medication uh, earlier, earlier, and with uh, you know better dosing certainly has a a great benefit. I'm sure the patient has a better experience to it. You think about it from a healthcare standpoint as well. You're getting the patient on the right medication sooner. That's going to be resulting in less doctor's appointments, less medications they're filling earlier. So that's got a tremendous opportunity to help reduce cost in healthcare, which is also a very big and important topic. So that that's a lot of great information, Martin. And I just want. I, what we haven't talked about is where the patient goes and get the test. And, oh, and yes. that will be locally determined. So they may end up with a test from one company. You, as a pharmacist, you may have 10 companies providing tests to your patients. And I just wanted to say that our platform will be able to read all that information. So it doesn't matter. It's test agnostic, whether that patient had whole genome sequencing or uh, a, a very small panel. And I think that's important um, for, you know, when you're looking at decision support, that it is test agnostic. Yeah, that's a great point to add, Martin. So thank you for uh, for interjecting there with that additional yeah. information. <laughs> Very helpful. And and again, it was my completely my pleasure to have you here on the Quality Corner Show as someone that is a uh, science uh, fiend by background. I loved getting into and hearing uh, this topic. I don't get to get into as much deep science information now in the day job as I used to, but I really enjoyed this conversation. And it's been a great opportunity for us to talk about ph pharmacogenetic testing and how it presents such a great opportunity to improve patient care and how it's further utilizing pharmacists as part of that patient care team. Now, before we do close out the episode, I reference we always end with a fun question that we get to get so that we get to know our guest a little bit more. And Martin, we've been exploring potential travel destinations with some of our other guests in recent weeks. I understand you can add a, quite a bit of context to this conversation regarding travel in the Pacific Northwest and specifically the Pacific Northwest coastline. So for your final bit of questions here, would love to hear from you. Why is the Pacific Northwest coastline important to you personally? And can you share any recommendations for folks that may be first time visitors to that area or perhaps if they're going to be a return visitor? Okay, great question. I mean, this is the most spectacular part of the world to visit. Uh, and I visited many, many countries, but it's, it's an archipelago. It's lots of little islands and inlets with incredible wildlife. And for me, fishing, boating, uh, key uh, sports that I, I do to relax and, and forget about all this pharmacogenetic stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, last weekend I was on a river in the freezing rain, uh, whether it is rain or snow, I'm not sure, uh, for a couple of days, but it was just so much fun. And the beauty we saw, mountain goats, um, it, it's just spectacular. 
And for sailing, uh, it, it's some of the best in the world, although I would recommend having a motor because sometimes the winds do die. Um, and there are a couple of great places you can charter boats out of. Uh, and there are many places you can charter fishing trips out of. Uh, and they'll take you out to sea um, and, you know, catching salmon. It's unbelievable. And then eating it, uh, even better. So it's it's a beautiful place. Come. Well, Martin, between understanding pharmacogenetic testing, uh, which uh, can get us using better medications the right way, we also know that salmon is a uh, good heart healthy food as well. So we've got a couple of really good uh, tips here to help improve health uh, for all of our listeners today. And uh, so, Martin, before we uh, do close, again, really appreciate your information that was here. I really enjoyed this topic and uh, was definitely a bit more science focused specifically into patient care than what we've trad traditionally covered, but I really enjoyed it. If our listeners would like to learn more about pharmacogenetic testing and how pharmacy can get involved, or if they have questions for you, how can they contact you? Uh, so they can just write to me, martin.doors at genexis.com or info at genexis.com, G-E-N-X-Y-S, uh, or look on our website. Uh, we run webinars. In fact, we've got one coming up fairly soon um, on, on the topic. And we'll be delighted to talk to pharmacists. We've got a special product specifically designed for pharmacists to do medication reviews using pharmacogenetics if it's available. So absolutely contact us and we'll be delighted to speak to them. That's great, Martin. Thank you. And uh, with that, we have now officially closed our content for today's episode. We hope that you, our listener, have enjoyed our episodes in March 2021, as we've covered a number of different topics related to how pharmacists are going above and beyond to provide excellence in patient care. But also, we've talked about new opportunities for pharmacy. Starting next week and then throughout the month of April, we're going to be turning our focus back to a clinical topic. And for this round, it's going to be focusing on opioid management and patient care. So we've got a great series of guests lined up. So please check in starting next week. With that, I again appreciate you listening to the Quality Corner Show. And there is one final message from the PQS team. The Pharmacy Quality Solutions Quality Corner Show has a request for you. Our goal is to spread the word about how quality measurement can help improve health outcomes, and we need your help in sharing this podcast to friends and colleagues in the healthcare industry. We also want you to provide feedback, ask us questions, and suggest health topics you'd like to see covered. If you are a health expert and you want to contribute to the show or even talk on the show, please contact us. You can email info at pharmacyquality.com. Let us know what is on your mind, what we can address, so that you are fully informed. We want you to be able to provide the best care for your patients and members, and we wish all of you listeners out there well.